Okay. Are you ready yeah, now? Should I start? Yeah, yeah. Shall should start? I start? Yes. Yeah. After a brief introduction, of course. Oh, okay. Okay. Okay, friends. It's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Vinish Vijayan, Professor Vinish Vijayan, rather, for presentation of his lecture on. Certainly, I understand that it's on something related with NMR. And there is one thing that I read just today in the newspaper. That was regarding a startup company from Bangalore. It was founded by one Arjun Arunachalam. I'm sure that Vinish is familiar with that. Arjun Arunachalam has come up with a very interesting portable MRI machine, completely indigenous. So that will certainly make MRI, which is a rather expensive specialist technique in India, that will come to the masses, I suppose. So NMR research that way gives very interesting results. And Vinish certainly is, definitely is one person who can definitely do so much work in order to make NMR more accessible to us. Well, regarding Vinish, he did his PhD from University of Göttingen under the guidance of Professor Grissinger. After that, he did a couple of postdocs in Max Planck Institute, first with Professor Meyer, um, I mean, Professor Baldus, and later with Professor Lange. Okay, he actually got his MSc from IIT Madras. After that, he moved to Göttingen to do his PhD. And eventually, he joined Isa Trovandrum as an assistant professor, where he was promoted to associate professor, and he's continuing there. His research interests include NMR spectroscopy, structural studies of small molecules and biomolecules, method development for structure determination and membrane proteins, protein aggregates, combining both solid and solution NMR techniques. Uh, I think Vinish and myself, we were together at somewhere. I don't remember where it was where we were giving our presentations. If I remember correctly, that was several years yes. ago, immediately yes. after we were joining in ISRA, I suppose. Yes, okay, suppose. with these brief words of introduction, I invite Vinish to introduce his yes. talk, present his talk. Vinish, over to you. Yes. Thank you, sir. Um, let me share my screen. Good morning, everyone. And uh, can you see my presentation? Can you please go for the uh, slide show mode? Okay, is it possible yeah. now? Wonderful. Now we can okay. see you. We can see okay. the presentation also. Okay, great. Um, so, uh, what? Um, th good morning, all, and um, thank you for the kind introduction, sir. Um, also, I thank uh, organizers of MacCon uh, for the invitation and the opportunity to share some of our uh, work, some of our group's works uh, work. Uh, like Sir said, that our group specializes in using NMR uh, to solve some uh, interesting biological problems. Uh, here I present two proteins uh, where oligomerization state is important uh, for its function. We, like Sir again said, we primarily use NMR to characterize proteins. Uh, for those who don't know uh, NMR, um, may, see, it's a very good characterization technique, but to uh, to apply that to proteins is a bit challenging. But uh, but um, uh, uh, Professor Wutrich got Nobel Prize uh, for doing this challenging work in 2005, I guess. Um, so from there on, it took over. I mean, uh, there's lots of proteins uh, the, uh, whose structure has been characterized. Here I present two uh, such proteins where we use both pro uh, solution NMR and solid state uh, NMR to understand its uh, structure. The first one I basically is a solution NMR work uh, and later I'll talk about the solid state NMR work on another protein. Okay, the first protein is uh, called EB1, the end binding protein. Okay, so uh, the main function of this EB1, so if you, this is like a story, right? If you have to, in the biology, you have to listen to a story. So if you, in the story, you have to introduce characters. So here I am introducing my character and this is the EB1. So we have to understand this character properly. Uh, so, so main function, so what does EB1 do? So the main function of EB1 is to regulate dynamics of the growing end of microtubules. Uh, Okay, microtubules. Now, microtubules are only uh, like polymer of alpha and beta tubulins, and uh, there is a growing end. It forms and disappears. It's, it's involved in cell divisions, and there are lots of functions. This microtubule. It's like the uh, skeleton of the cells. 
inside the cells it gives the strength to the cells okay uh, so it forms deforms uh, so this this is this is a highly dynamic event that happens at the microtubule so uh, this eb1 protein specifically attached to the growing end how it grows it only grows at, in one directions okay uh, so these uh, these uh, polymers come and attach uh, to form this, uh, so see these monomers come and attach to the polymers to form these uh, polymers at only one end, not the other end. Other end is kind of fixed, while the open end has this polymerization. So EB1 comes, EB1 protein comes and attaches at this uh, growing end of microtubule. We call the plus tip end of the microtubule, and it gives it stability. Okay, so uh, let's understand what this EB1 is. EB1 has two domains: N-terminal domain and a C-terminal domain, okay? So N-terminal domain and a C-terminal domain. So, um, um, and also you can see that that C-terminal domain is a dimer, it's a dimer. So it, it, so basically total EB1 is a dimer. So you see that two of the N-terminals are there and then the C-terminal domain is do dimer, all right? So the crystal structure from the X-ray diffraction studies, uh, it is the N-terminal domain is known, then there is a C-terminal domain structure is also known. This N terminal and C terminal domain is connected by a link. Okay. Now, the first question was how is this EB1 recognizing the plus tip end of microtubule? That, that means the growing end of microtubule. We are realized, or my uh, our partner, Professor Tapasmana, had realized that GTP, that is um, guanos, uh, guanosine triphosphate, that has a uh, very, I mean, that is uh, concentrated at the plus tip end of the microtubule. That is that is required for the microtubule to polymerize. GTP is being expanded by the uh, process of polymerization. Okay, so uh, he hypothesized possible, possibly that EB1 recognizes GTP. Okay, so this was the first introduction for me, our group, into um, the NMR of EB1. So what we did was to see whether uh, EB1 actually recognize GTP because if EG, EB1 recognize GTP, then EB1 will also recognize the uh, plus tip end because that will be in the plus tip part of GTP will be on the plus tip part of the microtubule. So this was the idea. So uh, the, we asked this one, whether how does uh, EB1 recognize it and then whether EB1 uh, actually binds GTP. And this is what we see. So what we do is uh, to uh, 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 this is this is a portion of the HSQC, multiple HSQCs actually of EB1. Um, HSQC, this uh, peaks each peak you see, and it is given with a label D116, right? So that means it's aspartate uh, 116 amino acid. So it, 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 each one, like, like K66, that means lysine 66 amino acid of the EB1 amino acid sequence. Okay, so uh, these, uh, so we what we did, we measure HSQCs at uh, with addition of GTP eh? and see where the peak position shifts. I mean, if there is any shift in any of these peaks and we see this, say for example, H18, that is histidine 18. Histidine at the 18 position is shifting, okay? As, as you add GTP, it is shifting. Similarly, you see R17, which is very close to H18, R17. So this is R17 that is also shifting. Okay, so clearly GTP is influencing the chemical shifts of the EB1 protein. Okay, and from this, uh, you, you can quantify these results, and this is the what is the, this uh, what is uh, represented in this graph, where you have uh, the chemical shift differences or in hertz plotted against the residue numbers, the amino acid numbers. You can see more. There is a big tower out here, which tells you that this region is mostly affected by the GTP addition. There is also a small tower here, which is around 100 and 100, 100 to 103 amino, uh, 100 and 103 in the amino acid sequence, uh, which is affected slightly less. From one of these residues and the shifts of the residues, we can actually fit it to a uh, equation to find the KD, the dissociation constant of this uh, binding. Uh, and that turns out to be in millimolar range, three point, which is a kind of weak binding. So it doesn't recognize, it's a very highly dynamic um, uh, situation, dynamic binding. So where does this binding site is? And that is very concentrated. So that is in this region, R17 to M20 and K100 to D103. So K100 to D103, sorry, 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 sorry. Uh, 
uh, K hundred two is is less uh, affected. You can see this is less affected by the GTP, but this is mostly affected. Actually, it turns out that this part is mostly affected by the phosphate group of the GTP. It's a triphosphate, right? Phosphate group, and this part is on the base. The base is affecting the guanosine part is affecting this region, or that is binding to this region here of the protein. Okay, now when we we saw that okay this R17 to one uh, M20 is getting affected, so what we what did we do? We actually mutated R17 and H18 to alanines. Okay, so that means we removed. We thought that if you mutate it to something uh, uh, hydrophobic, like R R and H are mainly basic amino acids. So if you mutate it to a hydrophobic, slightly hydrophobic alanine residues, then the uh, uh, this binding will be stopped. If those residues are really important, and that is what we find, we find we took this mutant, mutant, uh, this mutant, and then and looked at the uh, uh, HSQC, and we uh, and then quantified the uh, chemical shift differences, and we see that only the uh, hundred region is actually getting uh, somehow my. Oh, okay, to come back. Uh, the, only the hundred region is getting little effect because phosphate, phosphate will affect this, but not the basic part. Basic part is completely eliminated. So the big towers that you see here have been eliminated because you have mutated those residues. So clearly, R17 and H18 is really important. Which is also we there was a, a cryo EM structure that came out of the EB1 bind, binding to the microtubule and also you can see the K100 region R17 residues of EB1 this side is the EB1 and this side is a microtubule so that is also bound so you can see that clearly GTP and microtubule binds to almost similar residues. Okay, um, then we wanted to see there was a auto inhibitory uh, notion of um, uh, 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 of the, it was uh, it was actually previously known that N and C terminal domain of EB1 interact. Uh, we wanted to actually investigate if the introduction of GTP would modulate this interaction because if there there was a previous um, uh, no, uh, previous idea about the activation of EB1 where the N and C terminal was close together and then when uh, and uh, when they bind to the a microtubule, it will move apart. So it is called the auto-inhibitory state. Auto-inhibitory state. The auto-inhibition is because EB1 interacts with the C terminal. So N terminal part of the EB1 interacts with the C terminal part of the EB1. Okay. In the previous, all this uh, uh, NMR, what we did was we only looked at the N terminal part. Here also we are looking at the N terminal part only. And what we did was we took EB1. We want to see if there is a auto inhibitory uh, thing and what what does GTP do to modulate this auto inhibition. Okay. So what did we do? We we took EB1N, which is the N terminal part of EB1. We measured the HSQC. We added uh, the C terminal part of EB1, and what did we see? We see that all the residues. So this is the HSQC. HSQC is a heteronuclear single quantum coherence, or which basically it gives you a correlation between the nitrogen and the uh, hydrogen of the amide resonances. Okay, so it is this single peak. These dots here, out here, these are like one NH uh, peak position. So when you add uh, C terminal part of uh, e, uh, C terminal domain separately, we synthesized or have expressed both these things, and then we added together. So EB1C was added to EB1N we see a loss of signal. So what does, ha what does that mean? It means that the EB1C is interacting with the EB1N. That is the first, uh, uh, first fact. And the second, because of these interactions, the size of the molecule has uh, become bigger. When the size becomes bigger, the relaxation rate increases. Okay, and that means the uh, the line line widths or line widths increase, and the, that means it, the line widths are broadened. I mean, uh, line, uh, the signals are broadened, and you dis see disappearance of the peaks. Okay, so that is why you get only very few peaks, and these are the highly flexible residues in the EB1N. Now, when you add GTP to this mixture, what do you see? We get back the, uh, we we started getting back the rest of the peaks. That means, what is GTP doing? GTP is able to stop the interaction between EB1N and EB1C. Okay, so this is what is represented out here. So EB1 EB1C complex is formed when they both are added, and when GTP is uh, added. Uh, this complex is separated. So it uh, favors this auto inhibitory state where DTP is able to uh, remove the auto inhibition of EV1N and EV1C. 
Okay, so this is uh, our idea, the, our uh, kind of a mechanism that it is in auto inhibited state when GTP added, this auto inhibition goes and then uh, the EB1 actually goes and uh, goes to the plus end. Now again, there is another role of uh, EB1, which is, um, uh, which is to understand, uh, which, is, which is like a Uber, like a taxi. Okay, so uh, EB1 will act like a taxi where it will, uh, uh, some other proteins will ride or will attach itself to EB1 and move towards the uh, growing end of microtubule. Okay, um, uh, uh, so not all proteins can be Ubered. I mean that not all proteins can be taxied. It only recognizes certain certain uh, proteins which have certain cards or certain uh, certain um, uh, signals, certain uh, sequence in it. So it basically EB1 recognizes certain um, uh, certain sequence like XX SXIP or uh, gap GLI that is uh, uh, another particular uh, protein. XSIP is a family of protein which has this signal. That means it has this sequence in the amino acid sequence. Serine, any uh, basic amino acid, that is why X, isoleucine and proline. So EB1 is able to recognize such sequence, okay? Now, uh, this type of activation, that XSIP binding to EB1 and then activating EB1 to move to the microtubule uh, growing end is not known, so mechanism is not known. Now clearly this mechanism, how CAPCLI uh, is able to bind to uh, EB1 and moving to the microtubule is known, but this one is not known. The difference between CAPCLI and XSIP is they have a different binding site. Now XSIP binds to the C-terminal domain of the um, EB1, while this CAPCLI, which, is, which has this sequence, GK and DG, as a amino acid recognition sequence that goes to the extreme C terminal end, which is like a, a floppy amino acid. So it goes there and binds. Okay, so they have a two different binding set. Therefore, it is uh, hypothesized that they will, th these two have a different way of uh, activating EB1. Okay, um, so uh, we, we are interested in this, especially we want to see how EB1 is able to, because the uh, the EB1 N-terminal domain is the one that is binding to uh, microtubules, not the C-terminal, but the C-terminal domain is Ubering. Like any taxi, what the driver sits in the front and the uh, uh, passenger sits in the back uh, back of the car, right? Similarly, uh, EB1 also does that. The N-terminal part, which is a driver, that goes and drive, uh, uh, attach itself to a microtubule, while the C-terminal part doesn't uh, is, uh, is attaching itself to the uh, passenger. That means the uh, uh, XSIP family of proteins. So what, uh, this is why we wanted to be interested in, uh, and it was known already that um, the XSIP bound structure of C-terminal domain of uh, EB1 is known. Uh, it binds to the hydrophobic. So you can see this, this, this is the dimer structure of EB1C, the two, so the, you have two dimers. This is one monomer and another monomer, okay? Oh, sorry, this is one monomer and this is the another monomer. And they are, this is a dimer structure. Uh, X-ray structure and EB1, uh, sorry, XSIP uh, proteins will bind here. This is the highly hydrophobic stretch of uh, EB1C. However, mentioned earlier, the N-terminal uh, determines the microtubule binding, okay? Therefore, we need to uh, have a structural detail of the full length EB1. The, it, the, these structures were only for the C-terminal part. They didn't actually crystallize the N-terminal part. Now, the problem with crystallization of any protein is that you have to freeze the uh, motions. Now, N-terminal part and C-terminal part is uh, connected by linger, and linger is highly dynamic. And that, that so it, it generally doesn't actually crystallize because if you have a dynamic part in your protein, it doesn't uh, uh, crystallize itself. So uh, they could separately crystallize N-terminal and C-terminal, but cannot have the full length uh, protein crystallize. So we wanted to see, okay, look at the full length protein and see what happens if XSIP binds to the uh, C-terminal and what happens to the N-terminal domain, okay? So this is what, uh, what our uh, idea was. Um, so what, what did we have to do? We have to assign the entire, the full length protein. So for that, for that we have to do three dimensional NMRs uh, experiments like HNCA, HNCOCA, HNCO, HNCACO, and this, something like that. That means basically what we have to do, we have to identify each of these dots to which amino acid it belongs to. So finally we got around 80% of the amide resonance assigned. 
Okay. Once we have assigned those res uh, resonances, then we started adding XSIP uh, peptide. Okay. So this is an actual peptide that we have taken. These are the amino acid sequence and we add it to this HSQC and we see certain shifts. Okay, so this is the uh, upper, upper meaning without the peptide, and this is the blue is the uh, bound peptide. So you see shifts coming, right? So clearly the XSIP is binding, and these shifts are localized again at the C terminal part of the uh, uh, C terminal part of the uh, EB1, so C terminal domain of EB1. Okay. Uh, and uh, we again quantified it and from the quantification itself you can see that in the ev1 n terminal term there is hardly any shifts very low shifts right very highly maybe slight changes in ph but you can see that the c terminal part you see drastic towers big towers this is the change in chemical shifts plotted against the amino acid numbers it's around 280 amino acids so big it's a big protein for nmr so you can see this uh, regions now uh, we can plot which are these uh, big towers forming residues on the structure of the C-terminal domain. And that basically fits with whatever structure that was there in the uh, PDB, that is the crystal structure. Okay, so they basically have the same binding site. That is what this slide tells you. Okay, now what we also observed, and that was, uh, that was I mean, previous uh, slide is not surprising because this is, uh, we bind, XSIP binds to the C-terminal domain and uh, you see shifts only in the C-terminal domain. But what was surprising, however, was there was uh, the, the, uh, the N-terminal domain, the residues in the N-terminal domain showed at least two-fold increase in intensity, okay? Two-fold in, in, uh, increase in intensity, okay? So the, you can see this, uh, it's almost, uh, and line width also co has considerably reduced, meaning intensity increases, line width has to reduce. So you have a two-fold increase in intensity and uh, those residues which are about two, who, whose intensity is above. This is only for the N-terminal part of the uh, EB1. Uh, our, we, we looked at which are these residues and we found out that most of these residues belong to, actually these are dots here, okay? They belong to, and these squares belong to the microtubule binding site, okay? So many of these dots belong to the microtubule binding site. So we believe that dynamics plays a uh, major role in, um, uh, in the XSIP activated uh, EB1. Okay, so since uh, the C terminal domains also, uh, C terminal uh, the residues in the C terminal domain also showed increase in intensity. I haven't shown there because that wasn't interesting. Um, also, uh, there were new peaks coming in, not, not new peaks, which were which were very hardly able to visible in the um, uh, uh, upper protein. When XSIB is added, then those pre uh, uh, those uh, peaks come up prominently. So, which means that there is some highly dynamic event that has happened. Okay, structurally it has not changed much, but there is some because structurally it hasn't. How do I know that it's structurally it has not changed? Because the chemical shift is not very different. You know, the N-terminal part is completely there. The difference in chemical shifts is not so much. Only the C-terminal part is slightly changed. Okay, so what we did was to measure diffusion coefficient. Okay, so using an experiment called DOSI. Okay, and uh, using this dosi experiment, you can find the diffusion coefficient of, of your molecule. And what we found, uh, what we did was to compare the diffusion coefficient found for EB1 and EB1 with the XSIP. And, uh, and we can clearly see the diffusion coefficient actually doubled in case of XSIP. It actually should have reduced because you are adding more the size. What is a diffusion? When uh, a diffusion, a small molecule would diffuse faster than a larger molecule. So when you are binding something, then that means the size has increased and the diffusion coefficient should reduce. But here, what we see is in the opposite side, that we are opposite. That means when XSIP is bound, the diffusion coefficient increases. That means that it has become, the size has become smaller. So how does that can happen? That can only happen if there is a, uh, because remember that EB1 is a dimer. Now, when XSIP uh, is added to the protein, that means it goes and binds to the C-terminal part of the protein, then, uh, then it becomes a more number. Then the size, of course, reduces, and uh, we can explain this uh, thing. So radius of uh, uh, radius of gyration or radius um, hydrodynamic radius is 5.09 nanometer from the diffusion coefficient. You can calculate that, and that basically reduces to 2.93 when EB1 uh, when XSIB is bound to EB1. We can also look at the uh, uh, correlation, potential correlation time of the molecule again through NMR. All these experiments are through NMR, and we that also measure the tau c. Basically, also tells you how large the molecule is. If the tau c increases, uh, that means the it's big. 
if a tau c reduces, then it becomes small. The, the size has become small. And that is what we observed. Tau c of the upper protein, that is without the excess IP, is 17 nanoseconds. And with the protein, it turns out to be around 11 nanoseconds, which means that the protein has become smaller. It can only become smaller if the dimer has gone down to a monomer. Okay. Now, uh, how does uh, EB1, uh, EB1 forms dimer? It is through the C-terminal domain, as I told you. And this is basically I, uh, hydrophobic interactions, isoleucine 224 and isoleucine 242 that comes together. I mean, the, these uh, residues comes together and uh, form a hydrophobic core, which is the reason it is a dimer. And it is known that it, it, it was never possible to separate a monomeric uh, EB1. Okay. It can it will always exist in nature as a dimer. So how does uh, one makes it into a monomer. So there was already, uh, if, if you mutate isoleucine to alanine, then the dimerization dissolves. It was previously known. So we did this. We, we took isoleucine, I mean, we, we mutated isoleucine 224 to an alanine and we got the monomer. But how does it actually, what was interesting is how did it become a monomer? Okay, so this is an HSQC of uh, the wild type. That is this pink guys are the wild type residues and this uh, green guys are the, um, uh, are the mutant where you mutate isoleucine 224 to alanine. And we find that isoleucine 224 to alanine mutation completely destroys the C-terminal um, structure. How do we know that from NMR, almost all the, there is lots of the starred residues. You see that these are all clustering around 8 to 8.5 ppm, 8 to 8.5 ppm. There are so many new residues that came up. Uh, the C-terminal residues were never there from the upper protein. So all these residues are now concentrated around 8, 8 to 8.5 ppm, which is characteristic of unfolded protein. That means that mutation completely destroyed the secondary structure. That means whether it is, a, it is basically an al alpha helical protein, the C-terminal domain, that has been completely unfolded. Okay, so I24 mutation, what, it, what does it do? It completely unfolds your protein uh, or C-terminal protein. The N-terminal residues are there. You can see that N-terminal, L30, all that are fitting perfectly there. Those residues are there, but the C-terminal is unfolded. They are not in their original position and they all come at the middle of the thing. So what we did, we added XSIP to this um, EB1 I22A. And, and, and uh, what was surprising is it actually folds back this uh, XSIP binds to the C-terminal and then folds back the C-terminal. You get back the same number of, I mean, you, you get back the residues which were lost in the C-terminal, okay? So XSIP is binding to the C-terminal part of the, uh, C-terminal part of the EB1, C-terminal domain of EB1 and folds it back, even if it doesn't have a structure. So XSIP is so powerful in doing that. Uh, so clearly, XSIP is able to stabilize the monomer. That is what we came to know because we have seen from NMR experiments that you can, when XSIP is added, dimer goes to a monomer. And similarly, uh, a mutant which has lost its structure on the C-terminal domain, when XSIP is added, it becomes folded. So clearly, XSIP is able to stabilize the monomeric EB1. So we did MD simulation, and we also, and here also, we say that we see that EB1C monomer. The, because it's the X-ray structure of only the C-terminal part was there. Uh, so that monomer part is actually quite, uh, the RMSD increases while with the XSIP, it is smaller. The RMSD difference is smaller. Also, uh, the more, uh, EB1 alone, uh, if you do a dynamic, uh, you see uh, uh, MD, you see that the final structure and initial structure are quite different. While when XSIP is bound to EB1, uh, C, and you do the uh, molecular dynamics, the final structure and sheet structure are, are relatively similar. So clearly EB1C, uh, it can, I mean, uh, uh, XSIP can stabilize the EB1 monomers. Uh, to look at what happens in the end terminal, we did had NOE experiments that tells you how dynamic the molecule is. And what we found, we, what we did was, uh, we took the difference in the HET NOE values between the bound and the unbound. That means the peptide bound and peptide unbound state, upper state. And uh, most of the residues had positive values in the end terminal part, which tells you that it is, it is getting more stable. That means it is getting more rigid, okay? Yeah, the end terminal is getting more rigid when XSIP is added to the C-terminal. XSIP goes and binds to the C-terminal. Okay, and that's uh, and the one those residues which show the most rigid uh, rigid areas like V61, T33, and H18, 
these residues are involved in the microtubule association. So reducing the dynamics of the N-terminal domain is helpful in microtubule association. CBI hypothesis, this is how it works. Also, we did RDC, residual dipolar coupling measurements, where we align the protein in a uh, liquid crystalline medium and measure uh, J coupling. But then, uh, because it is aligned in a uh, liquid crystalline media, you get a extra uh, information uh, due to the bond orientations uh, with respect to the magnetic field and things like that. Okay, this is called a residual dipolar coupling, not the full dipolar coupling, but residual dipolar coupling. So we measured those. Uh, from the for the upper and for the bound case, and we say we see again for the axial component or the magnitude of this uh, RDCs uh, is increased when when it is in the bound form, petroid bound form. That means that there is less dynamics. Okay, um, and also the distribution of the RDCs are different. Uh, so in the uh, in the uh, in the upper form, that is without the peptide, this is like this, and for the bound form the distribution of RDCs uh, is like this. It's more symmetric, which means that the structure of the internal domain has changed and it has become more symmetric. That means it has become more spherical. Now, if you, if you remember, if, if two spheres come together, then it is more, it's not anymore a sphere. It is, it is like a uh, oval shaped thing, okay? Two spheres coming together. Um, so when XSIP is added, this is, uh, it becomes a monomer, so it becomes a sphere, okay? So you expect symmetrization when you have XSIP added, added to it. So that is what we see here, okay? So uh, so this is what we believe happening. So when we have a EB1 dimer, XSIP adds, and then it becomes uh, EB1 monomers, and then, um, and then it, uh, it, this is also entropically favored because something is added, you get a monomer, and then that is being uh, going to the microtubule uh, end. So, uh, uh, so it is also entropically forward, uh, uh, entropically also favored. Uh, so this is now accepted in biophysical journal. The next protein, I don't know how many minutes, maybe 10 minutes? Uh, five minutes, how, uh, sir, how much time do I have? Yeah, you can take 10 minutes, no problem. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, um, okay, I'll be a little fast here. Uh, so this is a um, this is a very interesting uh, protein called uh, CPEB3. Um, uh, this is a cyto. Um, uh, usually, um, uh, let's go here. Uh, so uh, you know about prions, right? Prions are uh, you have this mad cow disease, uh, all these um, highly contagious neurodegenerative diseases uh, taken because of the protein unfolded uh, protein um, process, and they uh, they are highly uh, toxic to the nerve cells. Now, however, CPB3, cytoplasmic polyadenylation element binding protein 3, is a protein that is found in nerve cells, and they are an RNA binding protein, and that is involved in the maintenance of long-term memory. Now, how do they do long-term memory in mammals, in vertebrates, everything? So, obviously, we care about more about mammals, right? Us. Uh, and we wanted to see how this uh, works. So, uh, the long-term memory, how does it do? I mean, how, how, how does a a nerve cell store memory, okay? It is by connection. A memory is formed when there is a connection, a synapse formed between two nerve cells. Now, how strong the synapse is made, that makes the memory, whether it is strong, I mean, whether it is long-term or whether it is short-term, okay? How strong the synapse, if that connection exists, then you remember everything. If the connection is weak, then you don't remember everything, okay? <laughs> you, you forget, okay? So uh, our, when we say, okay, remember, 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 then we are basically making the uh, synapse stronger. The connection that we made, make it much stronger. Okay, so this protein is involved in making the synapse stronger. So this, uh, this requires a protein, you know, um, this synapse strength depends on um, uh, a synapse specific protein synthesis, okay? Um, and that uh, is determined by what is the nature of this protein, CPB3. If the CPB3 is in an amyloid state, that means it is an aggregated state, then it can actually enhances the protein synthesis and helps in maintaining the long-term memory because all this uh, work is being done by the proteins and these proteins require a trigger for the synthesis and that trigger comes from the aggregated state of CPB3. It's a RNA binding protein so it binds to RNA, helps in, in the synthesis, uh, synthesizing or transcribing the protein. 
okay uh, professor eric kendall who got nobel prize in 2000 um, in neuroscience was actually the one who found that cpv3 uh, is involved in this long term memory and um, uh, this uh, he's also found that the n terminal domain is the one n terminal it has two do- uh, domains basic domains which is the rna binding domain and the prion forming n terminal domain he found that if you delete this n terminal domain then it will lose its uh, um, property okay there are other known structures of cpv3 i mean uh, uh, homologs of cpv3 in other organism like aplesia that is sea uh, uh, snails uh, then orb to drosophila uh, in uh, insect i mean uh, uh, insects uh, so these uh, structures uh, structure studies are known but the, however there is no structure study on the mammalian cpv3 okay what and there there is a huge difference in the amino acid sequence and how they behave so we thought of working on this protein so for that uh, we uh, there was already a, a work some work done previously in the molecular biology uh, which showed that this prd1 this n terminal part of the protein can be divided into three sub domains prd1 lmd and prd2 and if you delete this prd1 domain then that do, uh, then it will lose cpv3 loses its ability to form amyloids so we went about trying to uh, see which part of prd1 it's a huge 270 amino acid which part of prd1 is actually involved to form because not all part of uh, residues all the residues will be involved in amyloid formation we want to see which part forms amyloid formation uh, so we took anyway we isolated the prd1 we expressed the prd1 in bacteria cells and um, and when we incubated it at 37 degrees at 8000 rpm it starts aggregating it can be seen from the congo red shift okay and also from the cd cd starts uh, uh, there is a decrease in the cd electricity which tells you okay it is being shifted there is it's, it's a mixture of alpha and beta sheets uh, uh, sorry alpha helix and beta sheets and uh, finally it is going up which tells you okay some aggregation is happening when we looked at the microscope we can see these uh, sharp fibers fibrils which is very similar to what what is seen in aplesia cpv okay uh, we also looked at how uh, how uh dianions uh uh zinc uh, 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 not uh, cation zinc uh and uh, copper uh enhances the aggregation and we see that um, both zinc actually zinc does a better job uh, mm-hmm. when you add zinc you can see fibrils within zero day in all other cases the fibrils are formed without zinc or within, without these uh, uh 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 metal ions we see that the fibrils are formed only in the 16th day of the same amount of protein okay now we have wanted to r- understand which part of prd1 is forming the fibrils so we did so much um, a lot of um, uh, computational studies and we found that the there is a particular residues which may be forming beta sheets which can form beta sheets this is thus that region okay however we cannot actually make this uh, in bacterial cells because this is a very short peptide uh, and uh, for nmr we requires isotope labeling so we require uh, uh, we require to express it in bacteria so what we did we took a little longer region which is 101 to 194 region uh, and that amino acid sequence is given there so around 90 amino acids or so uh, and which this part is also part okay and we went about expressing this protein and we again see nice more homogeneous fibrils than the prd1 uh, full length prd1 okay and in the x ray we get two uh, reflections one corresponding to the inter sheet spacing which is around uh, 13 angstrom and uh, the other corresponding to the the inter strand spacing which corresponds to so this would be the inter strand spacing which will will correspond to around 4.7 angstrom and uh, we see that prd1 core, uh, core fibrils uh, uh, can seed so it basically means it can template so prd1 is able to template uh, template on to the prd1 core fibrils so you take prd1 core fibrils sonic it and make it very small and you add prd1 solution to it we see that it forms fibrils in day 6 compared to day 16 for if you don't have any seeds so prd1 core seeds are able to seed the prd1 fiber formation okay um we also see f- with collaboration with the professor uh, um, srinivas murthy uh, in biology uh, we could see how prd1 and prd1 core uh, localize in um, cells and nerve cells and we find that uh, prd1 core and prd1 both localize to the membrane 
some PR in the PRD1 core case, some of them are leaked out of the membrane also. Uh, I, that can that means it can go, move out of the cells also, which could be basically because of a high uh, more expression for PRD1 core. But it could also be interesting because the prion prion part comes from you know what is prion prion meaning uh, 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 unfolded or a very misfolded protein comes into the cell and then it is able to uh, template every other protein and fold it into its unfolded state i mean it is not an unfolded to its own conformation okay that is what a prion protein does it is not a virus it is not a bacteria it is just a protein uh, uh, so we with uh, so this this could be interesting uh, in case of um, uh, for prion characteristic then we looked at uh, which part of prd1 uh, uh, core is actually forming the core of the fibrils okay to, for that we did what we call the xd exchange solution in mr okay so uh, uh, when when the xd exchange happens the the beta sheet formed residues will have will not exchange with uh, deuterium while the flexible region will exchange with deuterium so the nmr signal is going to drop okay and that is what we are going to uh, see here and you see that uh, the if you take the intensity ratio between the uh, d2o and h2o where there is a complete drop in intensity that many of these residues here in the flexible these are are the flexible residues when there is no drop that means they are forming beta sheets okay this amyloid formation is formation of beta sheets i hope that was clear in the previous slides so here what we see is that this region the n terminal region of this prd1 core is forming beta sheets okay and we can actually divide based on the xt exchange to three regions r1 r2 and r3 region and this region specifically is a semi rigid region that means this region here and then completely flexible region up from 164 to 194 region okay um, we also did uh, maldi uh, studies by, by proteinase k assay it's a uh, protease which cuts the uh, exposed uh, region of your protein and then we can do a maldi and find out the uh, major uh, peak and we find that so we, the the problem with this method was that proteinase k has no specific specificity anything which it, it is absorbed it will go and cut it okay so we cannot specifically say which part it is we can only say okay there is this fragment there is this this could be the, our fragment and this could be the other fragment okay so uh, what, what what one can say from this study is that uh, the maldi uh, peaks that we see are consistent with the H, uh, hd exchange spectroscopy then we did solid state nmr okay this very specifically makes it very clear uh, solid state nmr we can do two types one a flexible solid state nmr which is basically using j coupling to transfer magnetization from uh, hydrogen to carbon and then absorb on carbon okay so here is a carbon chemical shift this is a what we call a inept based spectrum inept is insensitive nuclei enhanced by polarization transfer so inept based spectrum also sees a lot of peaks while cp cross polarization which is through dipolar coupling the the transfer of magnetization from the hydrogen to carbon is through dipolar coupling we can use that to tell you tell you that this dipolar coupling exists uh, only for the rigid residues and for the inept spectrum can only be possible for the flexible residues so this basically separates out two regions one the rigid region and one other is the flexible region okay so you get a rigid region here and a flexible region here okay so these peaks are from the flexible region these peaks are from the rigid region so just uh, making it into a 2d it's called the topsy spectra uh, we can identify a lot of peaks and these peaks were all from this region of your protein then we did uh, a lot of assignments with the what we call a spin diffusion experiment uh, that is that 13c 13c uh, correlation uh, we cannot in solid state nmr generally we do not uh detect on protons because the dipolar couplings in solids everything is uh together and dipolar couplings is huge for protons uh it's close to 120 kilohertz okay and uh, while we cannot spin you know we are doing cp mass right cross polarization magic angle spinning when you when you do this magic angle spinning you are reducing the dipolar coupling but we still will not be able to reduce that proton proton dipolar coupling unless you spin it to such high speeds we are here spinning at 213 kilohertz or so which is far smaller than 120 kilohertz required for removing complete proton proton 
uh, dipolar coupling. So we will have proton-proton uh, uh, coupling, uh, dipolar coupling. And in order to avoid proton-proton dipolar coupling, we actually detect on carbon. Carbon-carbon dipolar couplings are really small because the gyromagnetic ratios are smaller. Anyway, what we see if we get these peaks and when then we go about uh, doing multiple spin diffusion experiments and then about assigning them. And uh, we find that most of these residues are in the beta strand formation. And we can see the R1 has a beta strand formation. The R3 region, which is the longest uh, uh, uninterrupted uh, rigid region found from the HD exchange, that uh, that is also beta strand. There is some uh, level of um, a breakage in the beta strand could be some kinks that is in this beta formation. And we can break this R3 region into beta 3, beta 4, and beta 5. Okay, so clearly we have found the core of this fibrous. Um, what did we do is we took this R3 region, which is beta 3, beta 4, and beta 5, and made a peptide out of it. And then as soon as we put it in, it actually forms fibrils. And this is the fibril uh, uh, structure, which is very similar to our uh, uh, original fibrils of uh, PRD1. Okay, so clearly we have narrowed down the PRD1, the fibril forming PRD1 to this R3 regions. Uh, I think I'll stop here. Thank you all for your kind attention. This work, uh, the EB1 work is from a PhD uh, Shine A who has just moved out. Um, while uh, the um, Dhania uh, was the main person for the CPEB3 work, it is being continued by Faina. Um, uh, there are, I also work on tau protein, which is involved in aggregation, uh, aggregated, uh, which is in, involved in tau pathies, mainly Alzheimer's and other neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, Ashad and um, Parvati works on it. Um, Shafiq also uh, adds in. Um, he's working on methodology part of NMR. Uh, uh, um, Safwa and Anne works on uh, TA1 protein, where uh, we look at the, how phase separation happens on TA1 and whether we can study with NMR how phase separation happens, it's like droplet formation. Thank you all for your kind attention. I hope I haven't taken much time. Okay, thanks, Manish. I'm sure that there will be some questions from the audience. No questions in the mailbox. Maybe in the chat box, there are no questions yet, but I'm sure that questions will start appearing. Vinish, I have a couple of questions. Oh. Um, apart from the prion PRD1 spectrum that you are talking about towards the end, that yes. was a solid state spectrum. What about yes. the other spectra? They, were they all solution phase spectra or solid state spectra? Uh, uh, this one, uh, no, no, this one. That's, this, that, th that's solid state, that's solid state. That is solid state, apart this is also solid state. This is also solid state. Uh, uh, ex apart from this, uh, this is solution state. Uh, because we have dissolved it in DMSO and then looked at how much, uh, uh, how XD exchange works. Okay? okay. So this is solution state and previous all are solution state. So all these solution. things, uh, these are all, all solid state. Solid state requires that you have a rigid region, highly rigid region. Okay. If the protein is soluble, we do solution state because that is more easier to do, more easy to analyze basically. Uh, and also easy to do. Uh, solid state uh, requires a little more uh, it's, 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 we still have to work on 2D NMRs. Uh, in solution state, we have to work on 3D and 4D, four dimension, any dimension. We can go to any dimension because the relaxation rate is so favorable for us. Uh, but solid state, the, as soon as you put the magnetization onto the transverse plane, it just goes back very fast. And uh, therefore, uh, the signals are very broad. So analysis is a night. Uh, is a, is a, you require much more involved analysis in solid state NMR. Okay, and uh, the solvent used to us DMSO, isn't it? Almost yeah. Low. For the for the for the no no no. Uh, normal proteins uh, have to be in a buffer, buffered uh, solutions, and so that is very close to uh, around seven p uh, seven pH. Uh, solution enema requires it to be slightly acidic because uh, slightly meaning it's like six point five. Uh, pH such that the amide resonance, NH resonance, and NH resonance are much labile, right? So that means um, uh, if you make it as slightly acidic, it is less chance of uh, going away. Uh, so yes. that the uh, exchange is less. Okay, so you use the acidic medium to reduce slightly exchange. acidic, slightly acidic, not slightly too acidic. much. <laughs> yeah, otherwise it would be. <laughs> yeah, then it will not be the structure will change. Not not the the hydrogen bonds so that's yeah. a problem. 
Yeah. And um, I mean, what sort of element, what field did you use or frequency? 700, 700 megahertz. 700 megahertz. Uh, uh, for the uh, this uh, this uh, this structure uh, this uh, solid state NMR star, this one, 800 megahertz for the uh, in TFR Hyderabad. Uh, sorry, TFR Bombay. Uh, I have we had to go to do the um, uh, 3D NMRs. At that time, we didn't have the 700. If it if we had the 700, we would have done it here. So you basically were depending on the HSQC technique, isn't it? HSQC, uh, no, I didn't show all other techniques. HSQC is just to show you that uh, the information that you get by, uh, in, to get, for example, just labeling this with all these residues with uh, I, uh, 111 phenyl aniline. That requires you have to do multiple 3D NMR experiments mm -hmm. to actually identify this residue belong to 111 uh, uh, phenyl aniline. Okay. Uh, is, so, uh, so this is the final. Yeah, we ba we basically use HSQCs for this uh, interaction studies. Yes, but why didn't you think about HMQC? HMQC is similar to HSQC, but HSQC is. Uh, uh, is well, it because of the molecular mass problem? Uh, not really. HMQC actually works with high molecular mass. So here the sensitivity is a. Uh, uh, it's a problem. So I mean, it's, it's, it's better when with HSQC. Okay. All right. No more questions appearing in the chat box. Okay. It seems that there are, yeah. Oh, sorry. There are a couple of questions from the audience. Okay. Good. Uh, hello. Hello. Uh, I have this uh, first uh, exam, first work that you are showing that there was a uh, dimer formation and which goes into monomer. Yeah. And in one of the cases, there was this hydrophobic interactions you mentioned between two isolutions, which is uh, mostly responsible for having this di dimer. Yeah. So I just uh, was wondering that uh, it's a, just a one pair of uh, residues. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, uh, if we just think uh, that uh, amount of the interaction energy that can give, that will be quite less. So I just want to know whether did you observe any other synergic effects happening in the whole uh, protein uh, when you replace it by alanine? It just of course when you replace it uh, monomerai, so that could be the most crucial replacement. But other yeah. than just that fact, is there anything else associated with that replacement? That was my first question from the first. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, can I can I reply? Um, so the what uh, the isolution two twenty four to alanine that uh, mutation um, there is a hydrophobic patch. It's, I just showed two al al isolutions, but then there are there is a little more a little more iso uh, hydrophobic residues involved. Um, but we could we were not able to uh, really see what happens to every other residue because it just completely unfolds. Okay, because all residues now come at the center. It's like here. See, for example, this protein, this is a different protein, CPEB3, but this is an unfolded protein, completely unfolded. There is no secondary structure. Look at the chemical shift region. Region is very narrow. Usually in a uh, folded structure, you get a much broader uh, peaks, I mean, much separated peaks. That means the uh, uh, chemical shifts goes from, in the proton dimension, goes from several, uh, some nine or 10 to six or even five, uh, region, amide resonances, NH resonances. Okay, so um, here it is all jumbled up together, which tells you that this is an this is an unfolded protein. Similarly, there also what we found that when that was mutated, it soon the, the all the chemical shifts comes in a very narrow region, which is a characteristic unfolding of the protein. So we were we are not able to understand. I mean, we were we, we were obviously if we wanted to study what are these residues, how they shifts, how it folds. Um, uh, and all those things we require to label each of them separately. I mean, label meaning not labeling. I mean, we need to actually identify these middle residues. Okay, so which uh, uh, which peak belongs to which amino acid. However, uh, we were not actually uh, looking in that direction. So we, we we thought, okay, we see that it is unfolded. Okay, let's it's unfolded. We we're not going in that direction to understand what is happening there. But when we add XSIP. Again, that isolucin, there is an isolucin there, right? XXIP, right? There is an isolucin in the protein, which is which are basically hydrophobic. So they somehow go and uh, stabilize this C terminal, 
which I thought was uh, where we wanted to go. So that's where we uh, we went. Also, our focus was all on the end terminal part. How that changed because function we want to see the structural change and relate that to the function, which is the activation of EB1. Okay, and therefore we we did that. Okay, but it will be interesting to see what uh, how much of energy each of these because it's uh, it's it could be very less, right? With two hydrophobic and hardly if if the two isolations are coming, there is hardly any type of what could be the interactions. I mean. Uh, there is no ch pi there is no pi interactions there is i don't know what could, what other possible strong hydrophobic interactions that could be possible uh, yes thank you and uh, in that respect this alanine substitution is it just you have tried in many places to see or it was like no 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 it, actually actually it was known before itself that's what i, I said in the uh, uh, in the lecture also that it was known before that isoleucin makes it into a monomer but they didn't know that it was actually unfolding that we found out okay, okay. Uh, 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 that it is unfolding they only saw okay isoleucin to alanine mutations was able to do thankfully it was there in the literature it was there that isolation isolation to alanine mutation again alanine is a hydrophobic residue but it is a smaller hydro hydrophobic residue than an isolation isolation is more branched right it has much more carbon atoms and hydrogens uh, so this change was sufficient to uh, drop uh, i mean to make it monomer so we wanted to perturb the system very little in order to make it into a monomer and see the stability of the monomer but because previously it was not known that it, the protein can even exist as monomer clearly protein cannot exist as a monomer unless it is bound to xsip uh, that is what we we found out okay i have another question for the second uh, work that you have yeah. shown so uh, as you have already mentioned that we need uh, some buffered solutions for the protein stabilizations or with some kind of NACL and all this. That's the yeah, standard yeah, right, right. conditions yes. you have. So in those situations, when you change the solvent to DMSO, do you also have this NACL uh, thing there for the stabilization? No, no, no. DMSO is to dissolve the fibrils. Okay. And we look at... Uh, uh, we, uh, DMSO is done. DMSO is, is done to solubilize the fibrils. Once DMSO is there, it basically kicks out all the uh, 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 hydrogen bonds and then starts uh, solubilizing. We want. We, we are looking at how fast it is able to solubilize. Okay, how fast water goes in and compete with the DMSO. Okay, okay. Uh, and that is what we are looking at. So actually, there could be a kinetic study also, but we didn't do the kinetic study. We just wanted to uh, see which are the residues which are found in the uh, 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 core of the fibrils. We, we just want to identify those residues. Not we were not interested in doing the phys complete physical uh, chemistry of, uh, study of uh, the folding itself oh, it's, uh, or a defolding. Uh, uh, yeah, so actually, I have one more small small inquiry. There was uh, in the second uh, also you have this copper and zinc ions and yeah. they help in uh, kind of uh, aggregation mm. faster. So when it yeah. aggregates, do you see uh, those ions present inside the structure or they just don't be there? Uh, no, yeah, yeah, we did a edax uh, a thing on the time and we saw that it is there. It's there. Yeah. Is there any particular site or location where they are we, like? We cannot uh, specifically. Yeah, yeah. We didn't do the, the problem. Again, was that this this protein uh, aggregates really fast. Uh, so uh, so we will, so we it's very easy to we have done something similar for tau protein where we used zinc uh, two plus uh, and found how it aggregates and uh, I mean where it is binding and how it is uh, involved in the increasing the aggregation rate. But here we are thought of doing the same thing, but then we cannot have this protein um, stable enough or stable enough to measure H HSQC experiments or measure 3D experiments in order to identify right, the uh, residues. So uh, we were not able to actually see where exactly zinc or copper binds. But once we know the assignment, it is easy. If once if we can able to solubilize it and uh, able to stabilize this uh, in a monomeric state because this these cpp3 fibrilize like that really fast well audience any more questions to vinish seems that there are no more questions 
Okay. Yeah, that was really nice. We had two important sessions in the morning. And when we look into these two talks, we see that they are sort of complementary because to be basically was talking about how molecules self-assemble. And one important point that he was making there was uh, fuel, fuel driven supramolecular assembly. And basically that's what Vinish was also talking about this GTP binding, which really makes this molecule self-assemble. So basically both the talks are on, I mean, aspects are different, but one is creating self-assembly and other one was really looking into the interesting properties that self-assembly gives and how the real structural analysis can be made. So I think both these talks were extremely important that provided a lot of information to all our budding researchers as well as other participants. And also I should thank both Subi and Vinish for finishing their talks in time, answering the questions so that you know, the people who asked the questions understood the answers properly and the way in which they explained excellent quality of the slides. And of course, for accepting our invitation to present the talks. So Vinish, thank you very much. That was a wonderful talk. Thank you, thank you. Thanks, thanks, sir. Thank you. Okay. Can I leave? Yeah, you can. Uh, if, if you have any other doubts, you can write it to 